Hi, I'm Christy. You might know me as Brown Girl Green. I'm a Filipina environmental activist, and as part of the Changing Tides Foundation's Where Does It Go series, I want to introduce you to an important issue affecting the health of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, environmental injustice. I am fortunate to feel safe that I am breathing clean air and drinking clean water from my home, but many communities of color here in the United States cannot say the same. This isn't a coincidence. It's the result of environmental racism, which stems from policies and practices that negatively affect people's ability to have a healthy and clean environment based on their race and ethnicity. It is indisputable that pollution and climate change disproportionately affect BIPOC communities. But why is this happening? It started with white colonialism, which displaced indigenous peoples from their lands and created governmental policies that have made reservations key dumping and storage sites for toxic waste and fossil fuel development. Remember the Dakota Access Pipeline? Projects like that and drilling for oil in the Arctic Refuge are just a few key examples of the continuous threats to the land, air, and water of indigenous communities across this country today. And we can't forget about redlining, which is a system of racist housing and financial policies that discriminated against people based on where they live. Although redlining was expressly banned in 1968, similar discriminatory practices still exist today, leaving BIPOC communities disproportionately vulnerable to social and environmental factors. Here's some context. White families have nearly 10 times the wealth of Black families and more than eight times that of Hispanic families. Mind-blowing, right? Much of this can be attributed to redlining. Environmental racism leaves people with an impossible choice. Either build a healthy economy or create healthy communities. With the way our country currently stands, you can't have both. Speaking of health, let's talk about COVID-19. It's no secret that people of color are dying from COVID at disproportionately higher rates than whites. Why, you ask? Well, they are more exposed to air pollution, which is a mix of hazardous gases and particulate matter. Both short and long-term exposure to particulates has been associated with a systemic impact on the human body. Long-term exposure to particulates is associated with racial segregation, which is a result of, you guessed it, redlining. To put it simply, the air in low-income communities and Black communities is being poisoned by polluting industries that make goods for mostly white people. Which brings us to Cancer Alley, the 100-mile stretch between New Orleans and Baton Rouge in Louisiana. 80% of Black people in this area live within three miles of a polluting facility. Reserve is a mostly Black town right next door to Danka, the only U.S. plant that makes neoprene a synthetic rubber made using a chemical called chloroprene, which pollutes the air and is a likely carcinogen. After the Danka plant opened in 1968, whites migrated out and blacks were offered home loans and great deals on land in the area. It wasn't long before the residents of Reserve began complaining of constant headaches, shortness of breath, and widespread cancers. It took them decades to realize that this was most likely coming from the neoprene facility. Black Americans in Louisiana, especially those in Cancer Alley, suffer from much higher rates of cancer compared to state and national averages. To be exact, the area near the Danka plant has the highest risk of air pollution caused cancer in the country at nearly 50 times the national average. It's clear that people who have damaged lungs are more susceptible to COVID and the communities in Cancer Alley have been breathing air harmful to their lungs for decades, which explains why St. John the Baptist Parish, where Reserve is located, has the highest COVID-19 death rate of any county in the United States, with a population over 5,000. In the summer of 2020, millions of Americans stood in solidarity against the systemic racism that has plagued America. As people protest against police brutality and chant Black Lives Matter, the reality is that many BIPOC are being poisoned in their own homes and schools. The truth is, long before the phrase, I can't breathe, became the rallying cry for protests against police brutality, BIPOC have been choking and dying from air pollution. 
How do we preserve the lives of BIPOC who are experiencing the slow violence of a poisonous environment? Even after corporations and governments are held accountable for their wrongdoings, their gross negligence leaves scars for years to come. As Americans, we should all be equally protected, regardless of class or race. And now that the veil has been lifted, we must get to work to demand a healthy, equitable environment for all. So how can we be part of the solution? We can educate ourselves about local polluting industries that exist near our own communities and learn about how they affect Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We can get involved with local and national organizations fighting for environmental justice. And most importantly, we need to demand accountability from local, state, and federal government officials for environmental justice. This fight for land, resources, and the right to a healthy life has existed for centuries for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And now the time has come for us to stand up for marginalized communities across the nation. Visit changingtidesfoundation.org to learn more and get involved.